I'm excited for God's Word today. Um, I don't know, this message has been kind of burning in my spirit. We've been talking about marriage. We've been talking about your relationship with God. We've been talking about commitment. The C word. All through this month, the C word. In 1880, 1804, <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson, with an interest in the teachings of Christ, made his own Bible rendition. Jefferson took a razor and began to go through the Bible and cut out his favorite passages of Scripture and pasted them on a separate sheet of paper and made his own Bible. Now, the only problem with Jefferson's Bible was that none of the miracles of Jesus were included. In fact, Jefferson's Bible ended at the tomb. Jesus died on the cross, but he never rose from the dead. Now, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Someone taking a pair of scissors to the Word of God. I mean, the Holy Word of God. Can you imagine that? Taking a pair of scissors, opening your Bible. I have my Bible open right here, okay? And, and, and going, as, I like this scripture. I'm going to paste this on here. I, you know what? I like that scripture. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be blessed. I like that one. No, that one I don't care for. I'll go to the next one. There, I like that. I like that. He's, he wants me to prosper. Yeah, I'm going to cut that one out. Can you imagine doing that? I didn't cut my Bible. I wouldn't do that, guys. All right? I heard somebody ever go, oh, my gosh. No, I didn't cut my Bible. It was in my Bible. But let me, I did that to, to, to drive over a point here. Just like Thomas Jefferson here, who went through the Bible and he just cut out these things that he liked. And he put them on his own Bible, and that's what he read. Don't you think we do the same thing today when we pick and we choose our favorite passages? And we skip over those that we do not comprehend or we don't like. I don't want that one in my Bible because that brings some conviction in my heart. I'm not even going to read that one. Okay. So here's the deal. We, in doing that, we commit intellectual idolatry. We've created God in our image. Instead of living a life that resembles the supernatural standards set in Scripture, we follow an abridged version of the Bible that looks an awful lot like us. One of those areas that we do this with one of those areas that we cut out is the one that speaks of total commitment. What we have to do to really follow Christ with everything inside of us, all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our spirit, all of our strength. When we have to tithe, I'm going to cut the tithe one completely out. Okay? This total commitment deal. And also, we kind of do that when it comes to total commitment to marriages. And that's why we're talking about what we're talking about. We want to pick and choose, don't we? Let me tell you something. Scripture is clear. From Genesis to the Gospels, through the letters to the churches, ending in Revelation, God teaches us about our relationship with Him through marriage. God is serious about commitment. When you say, I do, it's for a lifetime with that, a lifetime commitment to that spouse in God's eye. When you say, yes, Lord, it's a lifetime commitment to God. 
See, people, and we've discussed this, people are involved in a lot of things but are committed to none, only when it is convenient for them. Now, here's the big issue in America today, I believe, as a pastor. We do not know what commitment really means. We waffle, we waver when we get uncomfortable. The psalmist asks, Lord, Lord, who do you want to be with? Who can dwell with you? And then he says this, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he that is committed to me, that's the one I want to be with. So what does God want in your commitment in marriage? What does God want in your commitment in him? And we're talking about this all through November. We're halfway through. These are lessons that I've learned over 35 years of marriage and 35 years of ministry. The C word, we'll call it. And in your notes, I have it as C equals. C means. Now let me review real quick for you because I really want you to get this church. First of all, we said that commitment means you're all in. There's no part-time Marriages, there's no part-time commitment in relationship to God. We said, number two, that commitment means personal growth. God expects you to grow personally. We get married, and a lot of times people get sloppy, dumb, and boring. We do the same spiritually. God wants you to progress. We said, number three, that commitment to God means you don't quit. Look, in marriage, there's no trade-ins for a newer model. When you fall in your faith, you get up. You don't quit. Number four, we said commitment is living victorious. No negativity. Nobody likes to come home to a home full of negativity. God doesn't like to hang with people who are a bunch of doubters and boring negative people. Right? So, as we continue, this is my desire. My desire is not to make this too hard for anybody. Because, you know, you can read and you can start making it really legalistic and really hard. That's not what I'm trying to do at all. But commitment does take work. But as your life is transformed by the renewing of your mind, as it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, you will find God's perfect will for you. How many of you want God's perfect will in your life? And then life becomes beautiful. Life becomes fun. Life becomes a joy. So let's go on to number five. And I had to tell you this this is where we're going to start, stop today, number five, one point. I'm going to give you one point today, and I hope you can remember this, okay? Commitment to God means climbing your tower. Means climbing your tower. See, marriage needs date nights or checkpoints. A time with uninterrupted communication and connection. Christ followers view life differently, or we should. To do this, we need that uninterrupted point of connection with God. A daily time of bowing before God, asking Him to correct, to change, and to guide our lives. Now, in the Old Testament... This is referred to as climbing your tower or stationing yourself on a rampart. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. Yes, how would you like to be known as Habakkuk? I don't know what they called him, but can you imagine calling him on the route? Habakkuk, you stop that. Habakkuk, okay? He was frustrated and confused at how God ran his business. He would complain and God would answer him. He would complain and God would correct him and set him in order. Guys, prayer, connecting with God, 
realigns our lives back to God's plan. Because it's so easy to get off plan. If you have your Bibles, turn to that minor prophet, Habakkuk. If you don't have your Bibles, I have it in the notes so you can read it. And read with me what this prophet did. He had just asked God and complained to God about things that were going on. He couldn't understand why in the world that wicked people were prospering. He couldn't understand why the world was the way that it was, going fine, and God wasn't doing anything. And he gets up into, to, before God and listen to this. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 says, I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he may say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Listen, guys, commitment to God doesn't always mean we agree with how God does his business. It means I trust you, Lord, and I will obey you. And this is what Habakkuk is going on in his life. A couple of weeks ago, I told you about my mother and my brother both having surgery. We prayed for them. I heard from my mother. She's struggling for her life. But God is going to do what he needs to do. I heard from my brother on Friday night. You know, he had cancer. He prayed that God would get all the cancer and he would be all right. Well, they didn't get all the cancer, and he's got two years to live. I'm like, Lord, we prayed. We prayed. And the Lord says, don't tell me how to run my business. Okay? I'm going to heal them, but don't tell me how to run it. How often do we do that, right? And this is what Habakkuk was doing. And Habakkuk says, I'm going to stand and wait until God corrects me, until God guides me. And that's what he did. He said, God, I, I want to reconnect with you so, so that you not only can correct me, but you can realign the way that I'm thinking right now because my thinking is not right. Guys, that's what climbing your tower is all about. That's what getting before God is all about. And that's what the Lord has told me to speak to you about today, that we need more commitment. Committing to God means committing to connecting with Him. See, when you envision a watchtower, what do you think of? You know, you might think of a small building like up high, like they have on forts or prisons or something like that. Or you might think of a perch high above your position, right? But it's high up. As I think about a watchtower, as I think about a tower that is way above everything, four, actually five things really hit me that I want to throw out to you today. Okay? First of all, when you think about this tower that's there and, and, and you've got to, to, to go and, and be with God, the first thought that hit me is that, you know what, it takes effort to get to that tower. It takes effort to get to that tower. But the, he says, I stand at my watch post. I had to climb up to stand at my watch post. It takes effort to connect with God. It takes effort to get along with God in our busy schedules. It takes effort. Connecting with our Lord takes time, takes effort. Not just a passing connection on the way to work. Guys, this is not what I'm talking about. Because if you're praying and you cannot get lost in prayer on your way to work. If you do, you're going to be a fatality. Okay, you can talk to God and you should on your way to work. I'm talking about a designated time, a designated place where you get with God. 
That takes effort, doesn't it? Like a strong, like a marriage, if we want to keep it strong, we must make the sacrifices to connect. When we need to set a, we need to set aside time each day. Take your Bible. Take your prayer journal. If you don't have one, get one. Take a pen. Take a piece of paper to learn and to write when God speaks to your heart. And get alone with the Master. See, too often we want God to fit into our schedules and our lives. Commitment is rearranging our lives, our schedules for Him. It's not, Lord, here's my life, fit into it. It's like, Lord, no, you've changed my life. I'm going to fit into what you want for me. You know, sometimes we just have to say no to get along with God. Sometimes we have to say no. Sometimes we have to say no to that dumb football game. Sometimes we have to say no to that show that you just love to watch. That show is not going to give you direction for your life. Sometimes we have to say no to people, no to commitments, so that we can keep our commitment to God. It takes effort. The second thing I learned about a tower and noticed about a tower is that it's quiet. It's quiet. And station myself on the tower. Imagine climbing up slowly. You're climbing up, and as you're climbing up, it, it raises you above the noise below, right? Anytime we focus on our Father, we are lifted up above the noise. Like marriage, we cannot settle disagreements or do it properly. We cannot reconnect properly in the middle of a bunch of noise. And I'm talking literal noise too. You know, fights, stresses, pressures, issues, people talking, people screaming, and you're trying to work out your problem. It doesn't work. You need to get alone, right? You, you need to separate yourself. And, and this is the same way it is spiritually. When we stand and station ourselves, as it says, in our towers, we're in a position to hear, to learn, and to receive. It's quiet. It's quiet. Third, third thought about a, a, a tower. A tower changes your view. It changes your view. And look out to see what he will say to me. I like that, what he says. Look out to see, not look in, not look, look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. I want to see his perspective about my situation, my purpose. And where he wants me to go. And the heat of an argument in marriage, when stress levels are sp spilling out all over the place, your view gets skewed, gets messed up. And all of a sudden, you're, you're in this defense mode. All of a sudden, nothing's working. And when we are confused in faith, we only see our way, not his way. We let that old lizard brain that we talked about last week come back in. That lizard brain is that, that slow-moving, negative, fearful, running-from-everything mindset. Okay? The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things will be added to, unto you. Seek first 
what God's perspective is. Seek first what is the right thing to do, not what the comfortable thing to do, what the right thing to do, not what I want to do, but what the right thing is. And all of these things will be added unto us. Listen, guys, you've got to get along with God in order to see this, to see his view, his perspective. Number four, the fourth thing is that when you, about a tower is that it reveals strategy. It reveals the strategy of your enemy, because you can see what they're doing, and it reveals strategy in what God has for you. You can see the big picture. And I love what he says in Habakkuk 2.2. 2. He says, and the Lord answered me. And the Lord answered me. The Lord always answers. But we are not always ready to receive those instructions. You see, here's the deal. We want a Lord that... We just want our, to, to say prayers and things happen. We don't want work. We just want magical answers. You know, it's like people who, who are trying to lose weight and get healthy. We want to take a pill one night, wake up the next morning, and look like we're 16 again. It's not going to happen. This takes work. The same with our spiritual lives, guys. I'm glad my father doesn't produce lazy believers. I'm glad my father doesn't require his, I mean, requires his kids to do a little bit of faith walking in order to find the, mir the miraculous. Like marriage, we have to work out our strategy, but often we just expect things to be easy. Hmm. When we take time and connect with God, we receive not just com comfort, but we receive correction and we receive strategy. Strategy for what he wants us to do. Now, when we see through God's eyes, of course, like I said earlier, we can see what the enemy is doing. You can see the maneuvering. He gives you that discernment in prayer. And then he gives you the strategy to battle against that strategy. How many of you know that God's strategy is a lot better than Satan? Satan has a strategy. He just wants to kill you. But God's got a greater strategy, right? And he says, you can write out a vision, a plan to win against all odds and see the supernatural become natural to us. It's kind of interesting. Number five. This one is... Very important. This one is bottom line. This is why you stay in that prayer tower. This is the biggest reason. Number five, it's key for God's anointing on your life. Let me talk about this word anointing. Okay? You've, you've heard it in the church. You've heard it when we're talking about preachers preaching, right? Oh, he's an anointed guy, you know? That was an anointed message. And that's, it's really used in terms of the church, okay? But listen, each one of you can be an anointed vessel of God. There's anointed doctors. There's anointed lawyers. There's anointed carpenters. There's anointed bricklayers. There's anointed uh, pharmacists. There's anointed grocery store workers. There's anointed tech people. There's anointed people. There's anointed nurses. There's anointed people. Every one of us are anointed and can be anointed of the Spirit of God to do what God has planned for us to do where we are with what we have. You're anointed. And when you're in that tower and you're seeking God and you're connecting with Him, 
This anointing comes. Look what happens. Jesus, the, the Lord said to Habakkuk, he says, write the vision. Make it plain so he may run who reads it. For the still the vision awaits for the appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. You know, the anointing gives you patience. It really does. There are good ideas in life. How many of you know that? Man, I had a great idea. All of us have good ideas. But then there are God ideas. Commitment is following God ideas for your life. You are one God ideal away from changing history. You are one God ideal away from changing your family for generations. You are one God ideal for leading thousands of people to Jesus. You're one God ideal away from being financially free. You're one God ideal away from being healed. Now the key to this kind of miracle is the anointing of God. And it's not just for preachers on a platform. It is for every child of God doing what God has called you to do. You're anointed. I can spot them a mile away. I can spot anointed grocery store clerk. I, I can spot an anointed musician, even if he's not singing about Jesus, I can spot an anointing. I can spot an anointed football player. And you can too. But we get that anointing when we are connecting with God. And we have his idea. Mark Batterson, one of my favorite authors. I read all of his books. He's a great guy. Assembly of God preacher. Okay? He says it like this. The anointing of God is a mysterious intangible that is difficult to define, but it supernaturally enables us to function beyond our ability. It is the divine favor of God that defiles human explanation. And the net result is that we become better than our best. Hmm. John, 1 John, towards the end of his life, wrote this. But his anointing teaches you about everything. And is true and is no lie. Just as it has taught you, abide in him. Abide in him. Mark Batterson goes on to say, God wants to give us gifts more than you want to receive them. But you also have to pray through your business plan or your game plan or your market strategy. You might even want to fast before you, your performances, before your elections, before meetings. And you can't just seek an anointing. You have to seek God. God, get into God's word and God's presence. Because the closer you get to God, the closer you get to his anointing. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is that which bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Wow. Apart from Jesus, we can't do anything. We'll fail. We will. You may think you're succeeding, but you're not in his eyes. I say all this today and bring you to this point. Here's my concern about people in the church today, people in, that call themselves believers today. I do it too. I see many people making life-changing decisions without seeking God's anointing on that decision. It looks good. 
it looks good. I'm going to have to do this, but it looks good. Have you prayed about it? Not only prayed about it, have you really gotten on your knees before God and spent some time maybe fasting and praying and asking God about it? See, here's what we do. This opportunity comes available. Lord, should I take this opportunity? If I should take this opportunity, let them offer it to me and let them have this much money that they will give me. Pick up the phone. Oh, it's it's got to be God. They're offering me more. Has it ever occurred to you that Satan heard that prayer too? Has it ever occurred to you that maybe that decision was a rushing decision that is not a God idea but a good idea? Has it ever occurred that maybe I need to spin because, you know what, this decision is going to take me away from my family. It's going to take me away from my church. It's going to take me away from, from my priorities. It's going to take me away from God. But you know what? Sounds like a good idea. How is that a good idea? Have we spent time fasting and praying? Seeking God. Listen, I've done it too, guys. I've made decisions that were absolutely stupid and foolish. And end up being a curse on me. Because I made too quick of a decision. If it's a life-changing decision, if it's a, a changing, something that's going to impact your relationship with God, your commitment to God deserves you spending time with Him Inviting the Spirit to really lead you. Don't just make it because you think you're desperate. Don't just make it because you think that you're running out of time. If you're desperate, you're running to the wrong place. You need to run to the altar. If you're desperate and you're hurting, you need to get before God and you need to stay before God. Fast and pray and seek His face. Write, read, listen to the Spirit, read the Word. And I want to tell you something. He will raise you up and give you a God idea, not a good idea. See, this is where I I struggle. Because here's what we do. I'm going to Go this direction because it sounds like a good idea. God bless me. Come on. Come on, God. Right? Instead of, Lord, I want to spend some time with you. I want to read your word. Speak to me. I want to, I want to pray in the spirit. I, I, I want you to, 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 to guide me and let me know. When we do that sometimes, we don't like what he says. We don't care about the words he says. But he gives you the grace. He gives you the strength to do what he says. That's my concern. This is my concern with believers today. We're just simply making all these decisions and we're not spending that proper time with our Father. Make anointed decisions. Anointed decisions. I see people getting married. Did you pray about it? Spend time with the Lord on it? I see people switching jobs. I don't, I, I, that's fine. I just want to ask you, did you really spend enough time praying and seeking God? Did you, did, you, did you stay in that tower until you got the answer? Or did you just do it? Oh, and it always comes back to get you, doesn't it? Oh, I wish I would. I thought I was listening to God. I thought I made the right decision. There's no way you did unless you really spent the time with God making it. Bottom line, 
Commitment to God means asking his anointing on your life decisions. Your life decisions. And learn to communicate with him. We just pray on the run too much, don't we? It's great. Pray on the run. But pray when you're standing still too. Pray when nobody else is around. And do what you have to do to do this, guys. If you have to get up a little bit early, for some of you that might mean 2 o'clock in the morning, but so be it. Go to bed at, you know, 7 o'clock. I don't know what you have to do. Use your lunch hour, whatever. Find a place to pray. Be with God and get serious. And serious is you got your Bible, you got a pen and piece of paper, you, you've, got, you've got your journal, and you're going to meet with the teacher. You're going to meet with your father. You're going to get some instructions. You're not just going to tell him what you're going to do. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin in ancient Jewish sacrificial system. But to reverse the curse once and for all required a sinless sacrifice. So God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know what Jesus did? Or God did through Jesus? He reversed the curse of death. Jesus is a master at reversing curses. So if you've made a bad decision, if you've made a quick decision, Jesus can reverse it. There's hope. He can reverse it. Shoot, I've even seen two people get married, they had no idea, no, they should never have gotten married. And I even told them they shouldn't have gotten married. And they fought like cats and dogs, and it was horrible life, ready to get a divorce until God entered the picture. And he reversed the curse, and they grew in love, and now they're living wonderfully and wonderful lives together. Shoot, I've even seen people make amazing, bad financial decisions that they lost so much money. How many of you know that money really isn't an issue with God? It only is an issue with God when you don't put Him first in it. But I've seen Him reverse the curse. And the finances, those people are financially free. In a matter of moments. A God idea can do that. God reverses curses. What decision have you made that has turned out to be your, your decision and not God's decision? And you are now living a curse. You are now regretting it. Satan is using it against you. And you are frustrated with it. It's standing in your way between you and God. You don't realize it, but it is. What decision is on the table for you right now? There's decisions being offered right now all over this congregation. You are being offered decisions. Okay? Don't make it without meeting with God. Don't make it without seeking Him. Connecting with God on decisions in life means commitment to Him because He's Lord over your life. He's Lord over that decision. He's Lord over it. 
it's committing to saying, Lord, I want your idea, not just a good idea. I want to follow you.